Good morning, everyone who is here in person and on Zoom. We have an incredible guest speaker with us today from our local community, but who is known across the nation, Nancy Minty, who is the executive director of Uncommon Good. If you don't know about Uncommon Good, you need to know about Uncommon Good. And so I'm glad you're here today. And I hope our entire congregation watches this presentation afterward because it is such a vital part of Claremont and beyond. Uncommon Good works with impoverished individuals to help with education and health, mental health, urban farming. There is so much involved and I'm sure you're going to learn a lot today. But Nancy, who's with us and is the executive director, has also worked um, by founding a legal services center that also worked with homeless and impoverished individuals She's been recognized in Washington, D.C. alongside Jimmy Carter. She's been recognized by Oprah Winfrey's Angel Network. And so for that reason and many more, we are so glad that she is here today. So if you could please join me in welcoming Nancy Minty. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, everyone. You're very kind. And it's so lovely to see so many friends here uh, this morning. Um, I. Uh, I don't know you, sir, but hopefully I, we will after after this morning. Um, and uh, uh, it's great to see to see you here, Lynn. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Lynn has been uh, working with us as a counselor for the youth in our program, and uh, we're just so so grateful for the wonderful, compassionate work that she does with us. Um, I see Janice Hoffman here. Hi, Janice. Uh, and also with me is a, a member of your congregation, uh, Janet Evans, who has been a member of our board of directors for many, many years and is one of our corporate officers. So um, I'm very, very honored to be able to work with um, Janet and to have been the recipient of her wisdom and experience for all of these years. So I also want to give a shout out to your entire congregation because uh, we just received a very generous um, $1,000 um, donation from the Board of Missions and Social Action uh, from the church. And um, we're, we're very grateful for that and for all of the support that, that you as individuals have given our work over the years as well. So um, I'd like to, to start, especially uh, for those of, of you who may not be very familiar with our work, with a little um, introductory film um, that we've made. And uh, I'd like to show that to you and then give you some updates on some things that have been happening um, since we made that film. So I'm going to um, share my screen with you now. Um, your wonderful John here has given me a tutorial on this. Uh, so before we're you going share, to... can you click share sound as well? There's sound okay. in the bottom left corner. Share so screen. Um, you know? Right here. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Um, and there's the video. Okay. And let's see. Share and start. Okay. Let's see. If this does it. Oh, can you can you give me a thumbs up if you can see it and hear it? Uncommon good is like the proverbial pebble dropped into a pond. A ripple of good in the lives of underprivileged students, their families, their communities, and ultimately the world. The vision of Uncommon Good is to create a more just, harmonious, equitable world for us all, particularly for those who are poor. Starting in the fourth grade, Uncommon Good mentors students in poverty until they are admitted to college. We had like a little boat that was floating on water and we had like candles underneath it that was boiling a test soup full of water, pulling a, a little boat forward. He also told me about other things about like why, how it works and why it works. So it wasn't just only the project, it was also the knowledge he gave me. It's the power of love that transforms the child into a person who can believe in himself or herself and imagine themselves having a successful future. In addition to mentoring, Uncommon Good equips its students with all they need to succeed in school and in college. We do a lot of educational enrichment too, to try to expose our students to larger issues in the world, to museums, to art, to theater. 
I was the president of Teen Green, which is a youth environmental justice program um, at Uncommon Good. And I love that experience, the leadership position that it gave me and the skills that I developed from it um, were amazing and they're skills that to this day I still carry on. 100% of Uncommon Good students go to college, even though 42% of their socioeconomic peers drop out of high school. I remember when I took Andrea to college, she asked me not to cry. What did you say to her? I, I said to my daughter, I'm crying because I'm happy because you're going to college. Recently, we analyzed the success rate of our students in completing college and earning a college degree. And we found out that 96% of our graduates had either earned a college degree or were on track to do so. To get these results, Uncommon Good also involves the entire family in the student's educational journey. Solo les decía a mis hijos, lean, lean. Es importante leer, pero no entendía yo lo importante que era leer. Entonces, cuando ya empecé, empecé el, el grupo de, el club de libro, fue este para mí decir, oh, o sea, es importante leer porque son cosas que aprendes y se quedan con uno mismo. Through our organic farms, the parents of Uncommon Good students are hired to grow healthy food. Half of our produce is given to Uncommon Good families who can't afford fresh produce, and the other half is sold to the surrounding communities to help pay for the program. Yo estoy encargado de la de la de la granja del templo y de la granja de la iglesia, los dos. Todo lo que se ve ahí es, es, está mi mano ya y la mano de Dios. Y me gusta cuando la gente llega a tomar fotos, aunque tomen fotos y me dicen qué bonito fue tu trabajo, cómo le hace, porque han llegado gente. In our Torah, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible were specifically directed to support those in our community in, who are in need and who are specifically food insecure. And we see what we've done here with Uncommon Good as a continuation uh, and really a fulfillment of that ideal that's set out in our sacred scriptures. Going all the way back to Genesis, one of the first commands is to, to be stewards of the earth and to do that wisely. problemón, la diabetes y sobre todo lo más triste yo pienso que estamos mirando en niños la diabetes que hay un alto porcentaje entonces de ahí viene lo de los agricultores que se me hace muy importante que nos están enseñando a comer más saludables como sus vegetales sus frutas e implementarlas a, en nuestras comidas Looking beyond nutrition to healthcare, Uncommon Good helps young medical professionals pay back the staggering student loan debt that bars them from working in community clinics that serve the poor. I was living in El Salvador. Most of your care was uh, received at the pharmacy where you would go and you'd tell them I have a stomach ache or I have this, I have that, and they would give you something to take. I was there at the pharmacy uh, waiting for my turn and there was this lady who had a kid. She must have been three or four years old. So the pharmacist gave her uh, a pill and the little girl started choking and we were just all around. Nobody knew the Heimlich maneuver. Nobody knew what to do. And we all saw this little girl choke to death. And so that made a huge impression in me that, you know, had somebody known what to do at that time, they would have saved this little girl's life. It made me think that I wanted to do something in medicine, something to help so that I could prevent this from happening ever again. My father was a, um, worked in the fields. My mom um, worked in a lemon packing plant. The way that we came up with uh, the name Universal Community Health Center is that we want it to be inclusive of everybody because we know that there are other populations that also need health care. So we didn't want to give it a name that would only attract uh, a certain population. We want it to be universal for everyone. We do not turn any patients away regardless of ability to pay. These young doctors also inspire the students in Uncommon Goods Medical Pipeline who dream of becoming doctors.
being able to speak Spanish, know what they've gone through, know what my community usually goes through in terms of medicine. I want to be able to be the doctor that they come to. I guess they would call it in our language, el doctor de la gente, the doctor of the people. Working at Uncommon Good has changed my life in many aspects, but I think the most important is knowing and listening to the stories of our families. My dad was uh, mostly concerned with agriculture. He actually went to school, maybe what would we consider kindergarten. And then after that, his dad, my grandpa, pulled him out of school and said, well, we don't have any hands on the field, so we're gonna need you. After I graduated, I ended up uh, coming back to Uncommon Good and I told uh, Nancy Minty about my story about how I was trying to go for towards medicine. So she helped me uh, get a program so that I can study for the MCAT and I also got a lot of help from uh, the people from Uncommon Good. The medical schools that accepted me was uh, USC Keck uh, School of Medicine, UCLA, David Geffen School of Medicine and University of California Riverside School of Medicine. When I was born, my parents were living in a very difficult housing situation. Um, from what I hear, because I don't remember it, um, it was a very small, tiny, cockroach-infested, rat-infested apartment. Without Uncommon Good, I feel like I would have not ever attended college. Uncommon Good stepped in and guided me through this very complicated, overwhelming, and intimidating process. I received a Hamel Prize for my thesis in anthropology for outstanding thesis. And I also received a Fulbright, which I will start this September in Madrid, Spain. Incredibly, Uncommon Good is even having a global impact. Its office, the Whole Earth Building, is a first of its kind green building. It was constructed by Uncommon Good staff children, parents, and hundreds of community members using little more than the earth on site. The building has been visited by thousands of people from every continent who come to learn how to build buildings that will not harm the earth and will keep people safe in natural disasters. We were all working towards one cause, which was the rising of this building. Um, and I thought that was so beautiful because Uncommon Good, again, bringing people together for the better of the world and for the better of the community. El resultado se ve, se ve porque muchas manos. Whether it's the building that we all built together with our hands, with our DNA packed into those walls, whether it's students who are becoming doctors or ethical business people or whatever it is that they choose, I am very confident that they are going to help us create this new world that we're envisioning. I did a lot of community service in college and I think that has to do a lot with what Uncommon Good rooted in me. I wanted to give back to others because so many people like my mentors, like the staff from Uncommon Good have given to me. So I was really dedicated towards helping anyone in any way I could. When I walk into the office, a lot of people usually know who I am and also say, um, my, my daughter looks up to you or my, my son looks up to you, they want to be a doctor. And so um, it honestly brings tears to my eyes sometimes just because I can't believe I actually um, impacted a lot of people like this. Excuse me. Thank you for supporting Uncommon Good as we transform our students' lives, their families, their communities, and our world. Well, I, I hope everybody enjoyed that. Um, it was, uh, it was a wonderful experience for us to, to put the, uh, the little film together and try and draw it all, you know, into um, one lens. Um, you know, I, I can uh, tell you a little bit about what's happened uh, since we made the film. It was uh, uh, pre-COVID and, and um, 
when COVID uh, hit, um, you know, it uh, impacted our work uh, as it did everything else. Um, the first thing we did was we had a, a staff meeting and we decided, uh, you know, would we stay open? Uh, would we keep the doors open? And we decided that we would, that the community was, you know, in such uh, need that um, it would be very important for us to, to be there and for our doors to be open and for us to do whatever we could to address the suffering in the community. So um, everyone agreed to, to stay, to continue to work, um, except for one person. Um, who was our development director, but she could just stay home and write grants, so that that was okay. And um, then, you know, uh, the the main impact that uh, we saw of COVID was that almost all of our families lost their jobs, and they were, you know, already on the the knife edge of poverty uh, to begin with. And so the the job loss was catastrophic, and most of them. Uh, didn't qualify for unemployment uh, because they worked in the cash economy and um, so you know the wolf was was really at the door and so one of the things we did was we created an emergency fund and we put out a call uh, for people to uh, donate to the emergency fund and we promised that every penny would go directly to a family in need we wouldn't take any for for our own needs and you the community responded uh, with tremendous generosity and we were able to distribute um, nearly $500,000 um, to families in the region um, in need um, who, when the wolf was at the door. You know? So it was an incredible experience for us to see that beautiful response and that beautiful generosity rising up from the community and expressing itself you know, so compassionately. So um, again, thank you to all of you who, who were a part of that and helped us to do that. Um, we also um, expanded our um, our uh, food program. So in addition to giving away food that we were growing on our farm plots, we also added um, non-perishable foods, you know, rice and beans and, and staples and things. And we set, because the other social services around us were closing, so everyone was coming to our door. So we said, anyone who's hungry can come and get food. Where, you know, you don't have to be an uncommon good family or, or client. If you're hungry and we've got it, We'll give it to you. So, um, and we've kept that uh, we've kept that going as well. Um, and then another thing that happened was really really poignant. Um, we we did a survey of our parents, and we we said, okay, what are your what are your top needs? And and keep in mind, you know, that at th at this point, uh, many of them were looking at uh, being evicted because they couldn't pay their rent. You know, because you know they were hungry. That you know all of these things that we were trying to address. Through the emergency fund but you know i was so touched that the top two priorities that came back from that family survey were was one um that they wanted to see their children continue to learn in school and they were very concerned about the school closures and um uh you know and that and it kind of made sense because these are parents who had sacrificed so very, very, very much to be here so that their children could have these educational opportunities. And then to see the schools shut down and their students struggling on Zoom and not having the technology and this and that and the, you know all of this kind of going to the brain was very, very uh, concerning to them. And then the the other top priority was mental health. And yet because you know the the normal stresses of poverty that they'd been experiencing, um, were of course you know uh, um, terribly aggravated um, by uh, by COVID and unemployment and all of the attendant uh, ramifications of that time, and it reminded me of something that that Mother Teresa once said, and uh, she had commented that you know even amid the devastation of the streets of India and the you know the the people living and dying in the streets, that the greatest suffering that she saw was the mental suffering. The loneliness, the abandonment, and that that was the most painful thing to for the people that she was serving, you know. And um, so, uh, what we what we decided to do was to bring to the United States a pilot, a mental health pilot program um, that was had been rolled out in other parts of the world, and. Um, it was an interesting program. It was called uh, Low Intensity Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. And as many of you, I'm sure, know, um, cognitive behavioral therapy is a, 
a very effective short form uh, of therapy, um, but you pretty much have to, you know, have the means to be able to afford to pay to, you know, go to a therapist to, to get advantage of, to take advantage of this. Um, and so it's not um, accessible to, to people who are poor. You know, my whole life I've worked with low income communities and it's been a, a truism that mental and dental have been the two hardest forms of health care uh, to, to find for people. Another reason we're so grateful for you, Lynn, and for, for you taking on some of our, our students. Um, but for in our area, there was virtually no effective services at all for the Spanish language community. And um, uh, so uh, what, what this program does, the, the uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, is it, it teaches people from a low income community the basics in cognitive behavioral therapy, which is essentially how not to be controlled by your negative thoughts and emotions. So it's mental health hygiene, you know, and it's not something that's taught in our culture. And when I've talked to our clients who are immigrants, I, you know, and I've asked them, is this uh, something that's taught in your home cultures? And they say, no. And um, so these basic techniques are taught to people in the community in, in a very uh, high quality training. <laughs> And then they go into their community and they serve as lay uh, mental health counselors teaching these skills to people in their community. And the thing that really grabbed me about this, this pilot was that when they then analyzed the results, they found that the people who were counseled by the lay mental health workers got just as well, just as fast as those who uh, received counseling from a mental health professional. So I thought, gosh, I want to, you know, this is this had been rolled out in India and Palestine and Mexico and parts of Europe. And so, you know, I said, I want to see if this works in the United States. You know, I really um, uh, if this works, this could really revolutionize um, the delivery of health care um, in low income income communities here in the United States. So, um, uh, you know, one of the advantages of Zoom is that we you know, are, are able to bring in resources from a much larger area than before. And so we were able to connect with the lead, the lead here in uh, Mexico. And, and, and um, she, uh, we got a class together of the mothers in our program who are interested in being trained to be uh, lay mental health workers. And uh, she, they received the training from um, uh, this, uh, Authority in Mexico, and now they um, are a group have that uh, is is to give mental health uh, assistance and counseling to the Spanish-speaking parents um, in our program, and and actually a, a very interesting thing has happened because the 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 patients in the program have started talk or clients have started talking to their families at home about the benefits that they've received from the program. And uh, we are starting to get requests from their family members in Mexico and in Colombia <laughs> to, to participate, you know, in the program um, via Zoom. So it kind of went international, you know. <laughs> and so, um, you know, after a year, we're going to have a um, an, an outside third party evaluator evaluate the results of the program to see if ours match those uh, that have been um, that produced in other countries. Uh, to, and then that will tell us if this really does work in the United States, you know, so um, preliminary, our preliminary results are, are, are good. Uh, the clients seem very happy. They seem uh, to say that this is making a, a, a great difference in their lives. So uh, we're hopeful um, that we're going to, you know, sh be able to show um, with this analysis that it really is successful. Um, another another thing that really came to the fore during COVID uh, was I'm going to keep my eye on the clock too. Oh, there it is. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, was you know our, our kids' struggles in school, and um, this was particularly true of our kids with learning disabilities. And uh, one of the things that has troubled us for a long time is that you know in the general population, it's estimated that one in five people have a learning disability. And of those disabilities, the, the vast majority of them are dyslexia. And um, uh, yet the way reading is taught in our schools 
dyslexics can't learn. They can't learn to read. And so if you're a dyslexic child and you have an educated parent, you know, um, your parent's going to figure out, oh, something's wrong. You know, little Johnny's not reading. Um, we better do something about this. And you're going to investigate and you're going to get resources and you're going to find out what's wrong and you're going to get your child the help that he or she needs to learn to read. But for poor families um, and, and families where um, the parents haven't had the advantage of an education, they sometimes don't even know there's a problem um, uh, because they can't really read themselves or can't read very well themselves. Or if they realize that their child isn't learning, they assume that the child is either dumb or lazy. And so the child gets punished. Um, you know, in our, our program, we had a, a little girl, an um, example, who is dyslexic, and her mother took away all of her friends, took away all of her activities, took away all of anything that she did for fun, and, and just said, you have to just study, study, study until you get good grades. Well, so the child was left hours and hours and hours just staring at a book that she could not read. And, and, you know, no one, you, you know, understood the problem, you know. Um, so there, there are many um, heartbreaking stories like that. And we had struggled. Uh, oh, the, the, other, the other part of the tragedy is that for 30 years, um, there's been brain science, neuroscience, that has shown how to teach dyslexic children to read, dyslexic people to read. And as it turns out, it's also the most effective way of teaching anyone to read. It's called structured literacy. But it's not being, reading is still not being taught that way in the schools. And in the teacher training programs, they don't teach teachers to teach reading through structured literacy. So it starts, you know, with that teacher training level where they're, you know, taught uh, a less effective, you know, a reading um, teaching techniques. And then it goes down into the schools and uh, and school districts pay lots and lots of money for curriculum and all that that does not get the job done when it comes to those one in five kids who are dyslexic. So, as I said, in you know, in middle class schools or, or more well to do school populations, parents will step in and take care of their child. But in poor areas, these children are just condemned to fail in school. And then in life, you know, one of the things they found is that in juvenile detention centers, when they test the young people, the majority of them are dyslexic. You know, so I I feel that this is a social justice issue, really. That if 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 you know if you're one in five, one of those one in five kids, and you're poor, and the only reason that you're going to you know fail in school and in life is because you're poor, well, that's a social justice issue, especially since we know the answer. We know how to help you, you know, and it's not being done. So we we kind of, you know, COVID spurred us uh, in the direction to uh, take some action about this. And in particular, because uh, one of our uh, staff, uh, our development director, is also a dyslexia expert. Um, and she started an organization uh, to help parents with dyslexic children. And so, um, with her guidance, we put together a program and tried to, to uh, get the local school districts on board, um, primarily um, Pomona Unified, Ontario Montclair um, school districts where most of our children attend. And it was a it was an uphill battle, as you can imagine, because um, you know it's very difficult. Uh, for educators to to hear this message, you know, and in fact, and you know, we've we've heard from some teachers who say, "Oh my God, you know, I I didn't realize I, I was doing it wrong my whole life. I've been teaching children the wrong way to read, and I I and I didn't know. I didn't know. You know, that's pretty devastating um, realization to come to. Um, but to um, their great credit, um, the largest school district um, that we're working with um, has come around and realized that, A, this is a problem. You know, uh, prior to us raising this issue, no child in our program had ever been identified by their school as being dyslexic. And we've been running the program now for 18 years. And um, so, and if you know, if one in five kids is dyslexic and you've never had one identified in 18 years, you know that this is a problem that's being, you know, overlooked. So, um, but now they have recognized that 
it is a problem. They need to figure out how to identify these kids and they need to figure out how to get them services. And so um, we're consulting with the, um, the, that school district now to help them put together a program that will address this issue um, in our, our largest local school districts. So, um, you know, so that's a wonderful, wonderful development. And, I, and after all of these years, you know, struggling with this issue, I'm so glad that, that, um, that we've put this together and that COVID spurred us to, you know, to, to take this on. So anyway, I've been talking for a, a while and I wonder if, if folks have any, any questions for me or Janet. Janet, would you like to join me in, um, up here at the podium? And, yeah. Um, yeah, so. You know, I think the, the wonderful thing about, about Uncommon Good is that every time a problem emerges, they find a solution, <laughs> and, and I love the the notion of the um, commentator on the on the video that it is like a pebble in a pond, and it just grows and grows and grows and expands and pulls in more people and and works from you know one issue to another and and uncovers problems and solves them. Yeah, it's just it's just wonderful. <laughs> Well, it really well is. thank you, Janet. And you know, and in in large part, it's because this is a community effort. You know, um, the heart of our program is the the mentoring and the tutoring of the the children. Um, the mentoring, you know, I, I do uh, call it that transformational power of relationship. You know, uh, which is just a fancy way of saying love. You know, and and um, it really does change the lives of our kids to have a mentor, a big brother, a big sister from the community who who inspires them and shows them that they too can go to college and be successful and have a, a rewarding life. And also our tutors, you know, um, uh, uh, we, we have both in-person tutoring and Zoom tutoring um, that people from the community do with our kids now to help them, you know, to be successful in school. And um, uh, we've got, you know, some folks from, from Pilgrim Place and some of the retirement communities that are doing this with us now. Um, so if, if anyone, you know, would be interested in, um, you know, uh, helping us out in this way, um, that, you know, just let us know. Oh, yeah, thank you. We have some questions. Oh, oh questions oh, in yeah. the chat here. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, um, the vegetable program, let me just give you a little update on that, too. You know, um, we, we did have a couple of grants that were requiring us to sell produce to the community as a way of pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps, you know, um, uh, instead of just begging for everything. But um, the, the, the problem, <laughs> problem with that is that, um, you know, the cost of hiring uh, staff is greatly exceeds any money that you might make selling carrots, you know, so it was, um, it's, it's never anything that really made money for the program. It was just something to a, a kind of, you know, uh, appease um, some funders. And so those grants ended and we, we decided that, you know, we didn't want to be a business anymore selling produce, but you know, we, we, so we give away the produce to low income families. But if there are people in the community that still want the, to benefit from our produce, they're welcome to come and to take it and help themselves. And we just ask them to consider making a donation in return for the produce if, if they, you know, if they would like to do. So we're out of the business, but our produce is still available um, to those of you who value it and would like to um, partake of it. And we've got we've got plenty of it, so you don't have to feel like you're taking you know food out of the mouths of the hungry, you know. So um, if you're a health conscious cook and want to come by and and uh, check out what we've got, you're very welcome. You can come anytime anytime that we're we're open. Say something, Nancy, about how um, it's even better than organic. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, we say that it's even better than organic because we don't even use the chemicals that the government allows organic farmers to use. Um, we use no, you know, artificial um, chemicals whatsoever. So um, it's completely pure food, locally grown. As soon as we pick it, we put it into our walk-in cooler on the on the campus so that it doesn't. It's not like dying on a farmer's market table or in a supermarket <laughs> shelf or something because you know even if you go to Trader Joe's or Sprouts and buy organic yeah it's organic it may not have you know all of the chemicals on it but it it was picked days ago and maybe trucked across the country and and you know it's been sitting out on the shelf and so it's 
it's really kind of dead by the time you get it. <laughs> Whereas our food is is still really alive, and you get the benefit of all of that, you know, um, uh, freshness and the the vitamins and minerals that are yeah. preserved. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, oh, the current oh. budget. What are uh, hours and hours of pickup? Um, the hours of pick you were for in terms of the public, we're open Monday through Friday, um, nine to five. We also have weekend and evening events for uncommon good families and clients and all. But if you were interested in coming by and um, you know checking out the produce Monday through Friday, nine to five um, are our hours. Want to say something about the budget? Um, yeah. Um, one of the um, our actually our largest program uh, monetarily um, now is our medical program. Um, we have we're up to about 150 doctors that we're supporting um, throughout the region, um, throughout Los Angeles County, and um, some of them are coming out of medical school over $800,000 in debt. It's 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 just completely insane and out of control. And with with that kind of debt, they can't go into the lowest paying jobs in the medical profession, you know, and, and work in the free clinics or the community clinics. Hi. I'm listening to some, a Zoom. Yeah. I'm trying to find something for Karina. Um, the clock in the kitchen fell down when I tried to change it, and I think it needs one more um, battery. So I'm going to put one, the one battery it might need up here if the new battery doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe she stepped out. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, okay, so where were we? Oh yes, the medical program. So um, 150 doctors is serving over 300,000 um, patients um, in the region a year. And um, uh, we have been running this um, uh, medical uh, loan repayment assistance program now for 22 years, and uh, we're the only uh, private um, loan repayment assistance program in the country um, that we know of. And so we've developed a, an, an expertise in this area. And uh, a few years ago, we were contacted by uh, the largest uh, Medical managed care program in the country, and they were struggling to attract more doctors into their practice because the cost of living in the LA region is so high that doctors couldn't come and work at a free clinic and pay their bills, to say nothing of paying their debts, you know, in LA County. And so, um, uh, so they asked us if we would, you know, um, uh, help them design and then manage and run a, uh, a loan repayment assistance program for them. And we we agreed and that uh, has become the largest uh, repayment assistance program for uh, uh, public health community clinic doctors in the country. And so we're administering about um, $8 million a year to doctors in community clinics throughout the region now. So that's, you know, been a, a very large, um, you know, uh, a commitment on their part and on our part to administer. Um, but it's making, you know, these wonderful doctors work possible, you know, and we were so inspired by them during COVID because, you know, of course, they were on the front lines. And like us, you know, they were still working. They kept the doors open. and. Um, uh, we're putting, you know, their lives and their health on the line to to assist people, and we were able to help them stay in business and and keep doing that uh, through this this program. And say something about how the doctors inspire our younger kids. Yeah, yeah. Over the summer. Yeah, you know the 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 little fellow in the video that you saw, uh, who's going to medical school, our student who's going to medical school. Uh, we. We learned a lot through, he was our first one to go to medical school, and we learned a lot about the uh, incredible barriers uh, that our kids face uh, if they want to, to, to go that route. You know, I, uh, his dad, who's one of our farmers, had come into uh, the office one day and looking very, very sad, and I said, uh, you know, Miguel, what's, what's wrong, what's wrong? And he told me the story. He said, well, you know, his son had graduated, you know, from UC Riverside, and he'd wanted to go to medical school. 
Um, but uh, he, um, you know, was working to help support the family, and they didn't have the money to uh, buy a, a, a prep, you know, a course for the MCAT. Um, uh, and so he uh, also didn't know that you had to sign up for a seat to take the MCAT a year in advance if you wanted to take it in California because it's so competitive. So by the time he got around to it, the only seat they could find was in Arizona. And so his dad said, well, um, that's okay, son. We'll, we'll drive there the night before. You can take the test and we'll drive back. And that way we won't have to pay for a hotel, you know. So there's this poor guy, you know, no preparation, you know, um, not knowing what he's getting into, staying up all night, driving on the road, going in to take the test. Well, of course he, you know, he bombed the test, you know. So when, when I heard that, I realized, oh my gosh, you know, we need to step up here again. Like you say, Jan, here's a problem. We need to step up, you know. So I, you know, consulted with all the doctors on my board and I said, look, we want to help our kids, we, you know, uh, get to medical school. What do we have to do, you know? And so they said, you got to get them the prep course. We got a prep course. The next MCAT was coming up in six months. There wasn't time to get a seat in California, but there was one seat in Portland, Oregon. And I have a sister in Portland, Oregon. So I said, hey, Kathy, can I bring my student up there and stay at your house and you know how to take the test and everything? She said, sure. So we flew him up a couple of days in advance. We got him all fed. We got him all rested and relaxed, you know, and then and then we just brought him in to take the test. I prayed the entire eight hours. He was in the test. I prayed the entire eight hours for him. And, uh, you know, he came out. And as I was taking him home, I said, you know, Mauricio, um, can you tell me how, how badly do you want to be a doctor? Like, how big of a deal is this to you? And he said, as badly as I want to breathe. And when he said that, I knew that he'd aced the test. And he had. And he got accepted at UCLA, USC, UC Riverside. And now, you know, he's finished his residency and he's a, he's, a, he's our first doctor, you know. So we learned a lot and now we're able to counsel our kids, you know, who are expressing an interest in medicine and, and uh, they're being mentored by students at Keck Graduate uh, Institute who are pre-med students and all. And so we've got a program in place as a medical um, uh, career pipeline program so that, you know, they don't have to go through what Mauricio went through. Um, and, the do and the doctors invite them to come to the clinics yes, uh -huh. and, and see what was ha mm -hmm. see what's happening. To learn about their practices. It's yeah. a kind of summer yeah. camp for potential doctors. Exactly, yeah. exactly. We yeah. even have a young doctors camp where one of yeah. our the doctors on our board comes and uh, shows them how to suit your pig's feet and you know <laughs> <laughs> do tests on each other. And <laughs> it's very exciting. I think we're out of time, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you, yeah. thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, for all of your loving support over the years and for all that you've made possible for us to do at Uncommon Goods. Thank you.